Oh, Islington already. We're nearly there. Yes. Next stop, Holloway. Oh, I hate women's prisons. Almost as much as I love women. Yes, well, <laughs> I should warn you, Joyce Wallace is a very pretty girl. Huh? Perhaps as well I shall be with you to give you moral support. Thank you. I prefer to see her on my own. Yeah, but she's bound to be shy about meeting you. Patrick Butler, K.C., known to his admirers as the great defender. <laughs> and known to others as that damned Irishman. No, I need to take her emotional temperature, so to speak. Give me ten minutes alone with her. All right, well, very well. But don't forget one important point. Well, what might that be? The charge against her is murder. We present Donald Sindon as Dr. Gideon Fell in Below Suspicion by John Dixon Carr. Made by me, Gideon Fell, on November the 8th, 1937, concerning the murder of Mrs. Mildred Taylor. When Patrick Butler met Joyce Wallace, she saw I had not exaggerated. Although she was very frightened, she was also very attractive. Who are you? Please, don't be alarmed, Miss Wallace. My name is Patrick Butler. I shall be your counsel to defend you in court. Oh, but there must be some mistake. I, I, I couldn't possibly. I mean, I haven't any money. Oh, that doesn't matter at all. I'm here to help you. But if it makes you feel any better, I'll take my fee out of the next wealthy racketeer who really is guilty. So you believe I didn't do it? Oh, you don't know how much that means to me. Thank you. Just let me ask you a few questions. How old are you? How long have you been with Mrs. Taylor, that sort of thing? I'm 28. I'd been with Mrs. Taylor for nearly two years as a sort of companion, secretary, nurse. Nurse? Ah, yes, yes. I, I gather she was a, a rich widow, nearly 70, and a bit of a hypochondriac. <laughs> yes, she was always taking pills and patent medicines. Living in Balham, in an old-fashioned house on the edge of the common. Were you the only other person who slept in the house? Yes. She had a cook housekeeper, Alice Griffin, married to Bill Griffin, the coachman. They had the coach house at the back. When Mrs. Taylor wanted to go out, he drove her in the Landau. There was a horse in the stable, and that's where... Oh. Uh, you were about to say that's where the poison came from. Bill had an old Epsom salt tin full of antimony in the stable. He said it kept the horse's coat nice and glossy. Ah. Uh -huh. And it does look very much like Epsom salts. A white, crystalline powder, soluble in water. But I didn't kill her. I swear I didn't. Of course not. Tell me everything you can remember. What happened on the afternoon before she died? She had visitors. Mr. Renshaw, he's her nephew, and his wife, Lucia. They came to tea. I, I was quite surprised. No? Why was that? Well, they live in Hampstead on the other side of London. They didn't often venture as far as Balham. Ah. Anyway, they had tea and I went to my room. About an hour later, the bell rang and it went on ringing and ringing. The doorbell? No, there was an electric bell in my room in case Mrs. Taylor needed me during the night. It's going to hang me. No, 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 I'm quite sure. Please, let me finish. When I went to her room, the Renshaws had gone, and I found she was sitting up in bed holding the bell push, the kind they have in hospitals on a long cord. She'd gone into her bathroom and found her tin of Epsom salts was empty. She said it was my fault. By the time Alice came to fetch the tea things, Mrs. Taylor had worked herself up, screaming, I know a young woman who'll get no bequest now. I'll ring my solicitor and make sure of that. What bequest? <laughs> She'd left me 500 pounds in her will. I know it's a lot of money, but please believe me. I'd never kill anyone, no matter how much. I'm sure you wouldn't. And what happened after that? She calmed down eventually. Alice made the supper and I remade the bed and settled her for the night. Then I went round the house making sure the doors and windows were locked. 
I turned the key in the back door and went up to bed. I slept soundly, and I'm certain the bell in my room didn't ring. Only... Go on. Everyone thinks I'm lying. They say she must have rung the bell when that terrible pain began, but she didn't. Yes, I know. Just tell me what happened next morning. I got up at eight, as usual, and went down to unlock the back door and let Alice in. Then, while I was getting washed and dressed, I heard the bell ringing. I thought it was Mrs. Taylor getting angry all over again, so I rushed to her room. Alice had the bell pushed. Mrs. Taylor was lying on her side in a tangle of bad clothes. Somehow I knew at once she was dead. Please, tell me everything you can remember. On the bedside table was a tumbler with a teaspoon in it and some white sediment at the bottom of the glass. There was an open tin of Epsom salts. I, I found out later that Mrs. Taylor's fingerprints were on it and so were mine. And had you touched the tin? Yes, I picked it up and looked inside. It was half full. I, I couldn't think where it had come from. But Alice Griffin says she never saw you touch the uh, She's mistaken. I know she wouldn't lie about a thing like that. But sometimes people forget. Of course. In fact, you may have forgotten something yourself. When you went down and unlocked the back door to let her in, I feel sure the key wasn't in the lock. I don't understand. I think you found the key lying on the floor, and you had to pick it up to unlock the door. Am I right? No. The key was where I left it, in the lock. Think about it. I assure you, I am never wrong. I'll see you again in a day or two. Perhaps you'll remember it by then. As arranged, Patrick came and joined me in a nearby pub, where there was a drink waiting for him. Your very good health, Doctor. And the continuing health of your client. <laughs> what did you make of her? Do you believe she's innocent? Do you want the truth or the barrister's usual pretense? The truth, naturally. In that case, she's as guilty as hell. Mm. You know, what makes you say that? Part of the evidence, partly instinct. I always go by instinct. And I am never wrong. But don't worry, I prefer my clients to be guilty. Where's the fun in defending someone who's innocent? Besides guilty or innocent, every person within the law is entitled to a defence. An honest defence, not a fake one. Put your mind at rest, Doctor. I promise you the jury will bring in a verdict of not guilty within 20 minutes. The case had created some interest in the press, and courtroom number one at the Old Bailey was quite crowded when my colleague, Chief Superintendent Hadley, and I took our places. And Mr Lowndes, the counsel for the prosecution questioned his key witness, Mrs. Alice Griffin. Mrs. Griffin, I understand that you and your husband occupy the coach house above the stable. Yes, sir. Mm. Was it your custom every morning at 8 a.m. to go from the coach house to the back door and be admitted by the prisoner who unlocked the door? Oh, yes, sir. And she did so on the morning in question as usual? Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, no, not exactly. It was a bit different. Different? Mm, yes, sir. The key wasn't in the lock. It was lying on the mat inside. Uh, Joyce had to pick it up and put it in the lock to open the door. Great Jupiter, does she realise what she's saying? I doubt it. But it would prove that someone else could have entered the house with a spare key. No wonder he's smiling. And no wonder Mr. Lowndes looks thunderstruck. <clears throat> yes, well, <clears throat> why didn't you mention this earlier when you were questioned by the police? Well, sir, nobody asked me. It's only when I thought about it since I remembered. I heard the key go into the lock. Besides, the door swung open during the night, and me and Bill, Mr. Griffin, we heard it bang. The wind caught it and uh, slammed it shut. Shook the whole house, it did. Hey, look at Butler. Now, that surprised him. It did indeed. But after a moment of sheer astonishment, Patrick Butler, KC, looked delighted. When he cross-examined the witness, he was still smiling. Mrs. Griffin, you told the court Miss Wallace never touched the tin of Epsom salts in the bedroom at any time. Well, that's right, sir. She didn't. And you said that when you first entered Mrs. Taylor's bedroom, you thought that she had had a heart attack. Oh, yes. I couldn't think of anything else. And you weren't in any way suspicious of the Epsom salts tin on the table? Well, no, sir. Why should I be? I hardly noticed it. Quite so. You hardly noticed it. In fact, it would be untrue to say that you watched the tin carefully, wouldn't it? Uh, 
I don't know what you mean. Oh, well, let me put it another way. Did you watch the tin? No, sir. So, from the moment Miss Wallace entered the room, could you swear she never once touched the tin containing antimony? Can you swear to that? Well, no, sir. I'm not really that sure about it. Not really sure? Let me ask you one more question. When you found the deceased and rang the bell to get help, was the bell push close to Mrs. Taylor's hand? No, sir, it wasn't. Otherwise, when she was took bad, she'd have rung for Joyce. Miss Wallace, wouldn't she? Stands to reason. So where exactly did you find the bell push? Well, it was hanging down behind the bed, Ed. She must have been in such pain. She couldn't reach it, poor soul. Thank you, Mrs. Griffin. I have no further questions. Patrick had been over-optimistic when he prophesied that the jury would reach a verdict in 20 minutes. In the event, we had to wait for nearly three quarters of an hour before they returned. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon a verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner, Joyce Leslie Wallace, guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. <laughs> Silence in court. There's a particular coffee house almost opposite the Bailey, where all the lawyers go. And when Patrick called in half an hour later for some much-needed refreshment, Joyce was waiting for him. I've been hoping I'd see you. I wanted to thank you. Oh, there's really no need. Please, I must. Thank you so much for rescuing me. Why are you smiling like that? Tell me, what are your future plans? I don't know. I haven't dared to think that far ahead. You're out of a job now. You'll need money. Of course, there's the legacy from Mrs. Taylor. Oh, I couldn't touch that. I'd see her face every time Look I... Look here, Joyce. Let me help you. It's the least I can do. No, please. I watched you in court. Sometimes I thought you believed me, but you were only acting. When I first met you, you tried to make me lie about the back door. No, no. You heard Alice Griffin's testimony about it slamming. She heard that. She said so on oath. It was probably next door. She made another mistake, that's all. Well, you should be grateful. Her evidence served you very well. So you don't believe I'm innocent? You never did. Let's be honest, shall we? I'll tell you exactly what I told Dr. Fell. You are as guilty as hell. I worshipped you. I still do. But one day you're going to admit you were wrong. And for God's sake, don't say you're never wrong. And with that, according to Patrick, she brushed past him and fled into the street. Meanwhile, Hadley, who had stopped off to telephone his office, joined me in the nearest pub. Ah, you must be a mind reader. <laughs> Cheers. We can be thankful the case is over and Joyce Wallace is free. Oh, we're no nearer finding out who killed Mrs. Taylor. But I've just heard some startling news. Last night, while Joyce Wallace was still in custody, something else happened. You remember Mrs. Taylor's nephew, Dick Renshaw? Yeah, of course. He and his wife were almost the last people to see Mrs. Taylor alive. Yes. And Renshaw was poisoned last night. What? With another heavy dose of antimony. Do the police suspect anyone? Oh, yes. Mrs. Lucia Renshaw. They say the evidence looks fairly damning. But that's not the end of it. Apparently, in the past three months, there have been nine unsolved deaths by poison in different parts of the country. And in not one of those cases has the Yard traced the purchase of poison to any suspects. But what has this got to do with Mrs. Taylor's murder? And why is Mrs. Renshaw under suspicion? It seems to have been a very unhappy marriage. And they say she's the only person who could have done it. I wonder who she'll get to defend her. Good morning, Mrs. Renshaw. Mr. Butler, how kind of you to come all this way. Sorry I'm rather late, but I don't know Hampstead very well. Although, strangely enough, this house looked vaguely familiar. Almost as if I'd been here before. Oh, of course. You've been to Mrs. Taylor's in Balham. The two houses were built at the same time by Richard's great-grandfather in the 1870s. Ah. The same builder, the same architect, the same doors and windows. And the same locks, perhaps. Possibly. I've really no idea. But what was I saying? Oh, yes. I wanted to apologise. I know I should have come to your chambers, but after everything that's happened, I really don't feel up to it. You must forgive me for entertaining you in my boudoir and in my dressing gown. Believe me, I feel extremely honoured. <laughs> what nonsense. 
Now you've made me smile. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't smiled much lately. Of course. I was sorry to hear of your husband's death. Yes. But I won't be a hypocrite. I must tell you, two nights ago in this room, I asked Richard to give me a divorce. And an hour later, he was dead. I see. Tell me about your husband. What was he like? As a matter of fact, he wasn't unlike you. It's not just a slight physical resemblance, but your smile, your gestures, there are similarities. Really? Let's talk about the night before last. Do you mind telling me why did you want a divorce? Uh, so many reasons. Of course, he was away from home a lot. He travelled a good deal on business, often for weeks at a time. But I was quite glad about that. And it's not because he'd been unfaithful. It was humiliating, but I'd almost got used to that too. No, we'd fallen out of love, and there was no future for us. And when you asked for a divorce, what was his reaction? He looked at me with absolute hatred. Then, without a word, he took a drink of water from that carafe on the table. It was a habit of his. Every night before he went to bed, he drank some water straight from the carafe. Then he began to get undressed. He was very angry. He suddenly said, "Unless you can find evidence against me, which you can't, you'll never get a divorce. Remember what happened last time you tried it." A few minutes later, a strange look came over his face. He went into the bathroom, and I heard him being violently ill. When he came back, he collapsed onto the bed. He looked ghastly. Then he said, "I can't tell you what he said." I'm afraid you must. It's very important. Well, he said, "You've poisoned me, you bitch." Then he rolled over, and I rang for the doctor, but it was too late. It was antimony, I understand, in the water carafe. Yes, the police were here for hours last night, asking questions, taking fingerprints. They seem to think I'm the only one who could have put it there. Can you help me? I'll do more than that. I shall save you. I believe you will. Thank you, Mrs. Renshaw. Do you think you could possibly call me Lucia? Of course, I'd be happy to. Oh, I'd forgotten. That will be Doctor Fell. He telephoned earlier to ask if he could have a few words with me. I'm afraid I said yes. I'd better make myself respectable. Could you be an angel and go down to make my apologies? Tell him I'll join you in a few minutes. Would you mind? Not in the least. Doctor Fell and I are old friends. My dear chap, this is a pleasant surprise. I've been having a preliminary session with my client. She'll be down in a moment. Are you here officially on behalf of Superintendent Hadley? Certainly not. At present, I'm in disgrace because I said that the trial of Joyce Wallace was a muddle from start to finish. Because Lowndes didn't consider the evidence carefully. Frankly, nobody considered the evidence carefully. Oh, not even the counsel for the defence. No, not even the great defender. <laughs> you were seeking a clever solution rather than the true explanation.、Mm. Do you realise that there have been nine unsolved poisoning cases recently? Surely you don't think they're all connected? Why, Thunder, I do. And all of them with just two aims in mind: profit and pleasure. You mean some kind of murder syndicate, hard assassin? No, 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 nothing like that. But what sort of group could exist under cover and in silence? How could so many people obtain poison without leaving any record of the transaction?、Hmm. Oh Lord! Oh Bacchus! What's the matter? Oh, this, this candlestick. Hmm. Just look at it. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Handsome silver candelabra with seven candle holes. Look inside the sockets.、Hmm. They're black with dust. They need cleaning. That's all. Perhaps. But what about the man who died in this house the night before last? The man who drank from a poisoned water carafe in the presence of his wife. Who told you that? I did when he telephoned me. I'm so glad you know each other. I'm sure you'll both be able to help me. And let me ask you, Mrs. Renshaw. Do you have any antimony in your possession? No, of course not. Excellent. I'm confident I can get you acquitted. And if you succeed, I'm sorry to have to say this, but the police might lay another charge against her. What other charge? The murder of Mrs. Mildred Taylor. But that's ridiculous. No, I'm afraid not. After Joyce Wallace, you were the principal suspect. As soon as she was acquitted, the police turned their attention to you. What do you mean? Mr. Butler proved that the locked house wasn't really locked. An outsider could have got in, 
and your husband was Mrs. Taylor's only relative. On his death, you became an heiress. You inherited Mrs. Taylor's house, the Priory, this house, Abbott's Lodge, and I understand there's a third property called the Chapel. Curious choice of names. What are you saying? Surely you don't really think that I... On the I'd... afternoon preceding Mrs. Taylor's death, you paid an unexpected call on her. That was when she mentioned her craving for Epsom salts and became angry because there were none in the house. Did you know about the antimony kept in the stable? Don't answer of that. course I knew. Bill Griffin told everybody to warn them. Ah. Yeah, we also know the back door key was not in the lock. As Mr. Butler pointed out, anyone with a spare key could have got in. It was a Grierson lock. Is there a Grierson lock to this house? There might be. I have no uh, idea. Uh, and, and Bill Griffin testified that more than four tablespoons of antimony were taken from the tin, which is twice the amount Mrs. Taylor swallowed. The murderer was keeping another heavy dose in reserve. Mrs. Renshaw, a little while ago you told me your husband said... You'll never get a divorce. Remember what happened the last time you tried it. What did he mean by that? I'd hired a firm of private detectives to follow him. A week later, they had to give up the case. One of their operatives was so badly beaten up, he finished up in hospital. So you thought you'd never get free from your husband. <laughs> but if you're suggesting that I'm not I... suggesting anything. I'm simply putting the case against you as the police would see it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Listen, Lucia, And thank I... you too, Mr. Butler. I'd be glad if you didn't interfere in my affairs any longer. There isn't a shred of direct evidence. The case against you may look bad, yes, but it's not... Yes, and made it look so bad? Just get out, both of you. Get out of my house. We left with as much dignity as we could muster. I expected Patrick to be angry, but he seemed rather preoccupied. At the following morning, at his bachelor apartment in a cul-de-sac off Pall Mall, he had two callers. The first by telephone. Patrick Butler. Oh, Patrick, can you forgive me? Lucia, I, I, I was just thinking of ringing you to apologise. But you did nothing wrong. I was a beast and an ungrateful wretch. Don't say another word. Naturally, you were upset. Yes, I was, but uh, how can I ever make it up to you? Very easily. You can have lunch with me today. Oh, I can't. Well, I shouldn't so soon after Richard's death. Meet me in the restaurant at the Royal Park Hotel at one o'clock, please. Well, perhaps I could. Thank you. And one more thing. That firm of private detectives you mentioned, I'd like very much to have a word with them. Can you give me their name and address? I don't remember the address. It's somewhere off Shaftesbury Avenue, but the name is Smith and Smith. Discretion guaranteed. You'll find it in the phone book. Oh, damn. Someone at the door. The postman, probably. <laughs> I'll have to go. Don't forget, the Royal Park, one o'clock. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, yes. So am I. But when Patrick opened the front door, it wasn't the postman. Good morning. Miss Wallace. May I come in? Well, as a matter of fact, I Thank was... you. I expect I'm being a nuisance, but this really is important. Through here? Oh, what a lovely room. It's like a library. Would you mind telling me what this is all about? In last night's paper, I read about Mr. Renshaw being poisoned. Are you going to defend Mrs. Renshaw? Well, yes, I but I... I thought so. And I believe I can help you. How do you propose to do that? You want to know the motive for those two murders? Of course, but I don't see what... I worked for Mrs. Taylor for nearly two years, and I couldn't help noticing things, little things. You see, Mr. Butler, your trouble is you're not very observant. <laughs> oh, really? Really. Of course you see things, but you don't always understand what you see, if you know what I mean. Yes, I think so. But I can only say that no one else has ever accused me of being unobservant. It might have been better if they had. And another thing. Thank you. I really don't have time this to... This case involves women. That's where I have the advantage over you. You don't really understand women, do you? What? It's only my opinion, of course. But I feel I'm sure that... your opinion really doesn't interest me. I see. I'm just wasting my breath, am I? You're also wasting my time. And I do have a number of appointments this morning, so... I don't know why I bothered. You needn't see me out. I know the way. Look, perhaps some other time uh, we could have dinner one evening... Mm -hmm. You won't see me again, Mr. Butler, until I can tell you the name of the real murderer. Oh, you think you'll find a solution before I do? I can try. Good morning. At lunchtime, Lucia Renshaw met Patrick at the restaurant. 
but her mood had changed. I keep thinking about Dr. Fell. Those strange questions he asked me last night about the poison and the keys. Oh, yes. He got quite excited about the candelabra in your drawing room, said it needed cleaning. Oh, what nonsense. My maid polishes it regularly. She keeps it spotless. Never mind. I have two pieces of good news for you. One, you're having dinner with me tonight. Oh, but you've just given me this wonderful lunch. Oh, this place is too crowded. I want to take you somewhere quiet. How about it? I'd love to, but I was hoping I might take you somewhere this evening. Somewhere interesting. Oh, where's that? I warn you, it's quite a long way off. We'll need a taxi. No, we won't. I'll bring the car to Hampstead. What time? Oh, should we say eight o'clock? Oh, did you say there was another piece of good news? Yes, I know how to prove you're innocent. I wish you'd tell me about that, Mr. Butler. Oh, you made me jump. Lucia, may I introduce Chief Superintendent Hadley? Mrs. Renshaw and I have already met. Madam? Good afternoon, Mr. Hadley. You surprise me, Superintendent. I didn't realize a man in your position would descend to following suspects. No, I'm not on duty. I was lunching here myself, as it happens. Uh, may I join you? Please. After all, we're all working together, aren't we, to get to the truth? According to Dr. Fell, there's some kind of murder organization which operates with poison and never leaves a single clue. Could you lower your voice a little? We don't want to attract attention. And I think I can tell you who was the head of the whole system. Oh, yes. So who is it? I said was the head. The chief organizer, who was poisoned so someone else could take his place, was Richard Renshaw. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. So clumsy of me. But Richard, a criminal, I can't believe that. Exactly, which is why Dr. Fell asked Mrs. Renshaw a lot of bizarre questions last night to prove that she knew nothing about it. But now you only have to find out who's taken Richard's place as the head of the murder gang and we'll have our poisoner. What do you say, Superintendent? We collect information, Mr. Butler. We don't distribute it. But I'll tell you this much. Renshaw kept three separate bank accounts in three different names. It seems you could become a very rich woman, Mrs. Renshaw provided Mr. Butler can prove your innocence. Oh, for pity's sake, you've only got to follow up the lead I've just given you. And how do you suggest we should set about that? There's a firm called Smith and Smith, a detective agency. One of their men was beaten up by some thugs, clearly hired by Renshaw. Find out who was involved, follow the trail back, and you'll uncover the murder club. Oddly enough, we already tried that. But Smith and Smith, whose real name is Luke Parsons, won't talk. We couldn't get a word out of him. Do you want to bet I can't? I've had a good deal of professional experience with villains, Superintendent. Oh, yes. And when were you last in a rough house? Oh, Patrick, no. Be Thanks sensible. for your concern, Hadley, but uh, I'll worry about that when the time comes. More coffee, Lucia? An hour later, Patrick climbed two dingy flights of stairs in a Soho back street and entered the office of Mr. Luke Parsons. Mr. Parsons, I'd like to have a few words with you on a rather complicated... Didn't my secretary tell you I don't see anyone without an appointment? Yes, yes, she did mention something of the sort. But I said I was sure you'd want to see me. My name's Renshaw. Oh, my God. What's the matter? Oh, you didn't mistake me for my brother, did you? He died two days ago, poor chap. I've been living in the States for the past few years, but as soon as I heard of his death, I took the first plane over. But you do look a little bit like him. But I didn't even know he had a brother. In the States, you say. Lucky man. Now, that's a place where firms like mine have got rights. How do the police treat private investigators over here? Like dirt, that's how. Yes. As a matter of fact, I have a little business of a strictly private oh, nature. Oh, my dear is... sir, d sit down. Look, make yourself comfortable. If you just uh, give me the facts. Well, it's rather hard to know where to begin. Yeah, it generally is. There's a lady involved, perhaps. In a way, yes. <laughs> Very understandable. But you know our motto? Discretion guaranteed. Just look on me as a sympathetic friend, yes? <laughs> I'll try. The fact is, I run um, quite a flourishing business in the States. Oh, yes, yeah. May I make so bold as to ask the nature of it? It's the same business Dick directed over here. Except I like to think our cloak is better organised. Excuse me, I don't want nothing to do with that. No, 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 I don't want to involve you in my business. But, um, you may remember some time ago my brother had a little problem concerning his wife. Oh, did he? Dick got a couple of enterprising lads to, what shall I say, get to work on one of your staff. I want to find those two lads and take them back to the States, that's all. Sorry? Don't know nothing about that. Can't help you. It would be worth your while. Would a uh, hundred pounds help to persuade you? 
I, well, I, I could uh, I could tell you where you might find two certain people. Um, I can't promise anything, but I need your assurance that my name would never be mentioned. What do you take me for? There you are. Now tell me their names. I can only give you one of the names. Henry Lord. You most likely find him at the pool hall in Bellman's Yard off of Dean Street. Not a word to anyone, mind. Bellman's Yard was at the heart of Soho, the wicked square mile. Behind an iron railing and down three steps in a shallow area, there was a grimy window with the word billiards in enamel letters. A few men were playing pool. One looked up as Patrick entered. Hello. Do I know you? I don't think so. My name's Renshaw. Bob Renshaw. I believe my brother used to come here sometimes, and I was hoping I might meet a friend of his, Henry Lord. Sorry, he's not here. But I've sort of took his place, and you're welcome to stay in case he turns up. How about a game while you wait? I don't know much about pool. I've played snooker. Oh, you'll soon pick it up. Here, take my cue. Get in a bit of practice. Thank you. Very aware that he was being watched, Patrick obeyed. He wasn't trying to play, just potting at anything on the table. Slowly, he became aware of a silence behind him. The room had emptied. Looking back, he saw he was almost alone, except for the man who had spoken to him and one other, raw-boned and with a broken nose and built like a prize fighter. When he spoke, Patrick saw he had two gold teeth which gleamed under the lights. He ain't much good at game, is he, Henry? Nah, he's not much good. I mean, he ain't no good at game at all. I think you must be the two men I was hoping to see. <laughs> he says he wants to see us, Henry. Now, why would he want to do that? I reckon we'd better find out. As he spoke, Henry drew a heavy pair of brass knuckles from his pocket, fitting them on his right hand. I wonder what he'd do if you was to stroke him with those. I don't expect he'd like it. Nah, but he couldn't do nothing about it, could he? Fear crawled through Patrick Butler. He studied the balls on the pool table, but with a throw of, say, 25 feet, they could smash a skull to pulp. We don't want him to start calling us names, do we? I don't think he'll be able to call us names. But what do you think he might call us, if he could still talk? I'd call you a pair of bastards. What do you propose to do about that? You're going to get it now, all right. Patrick's arm whipped forward, and he threw to kill him. The ball struck the man's shoulder and spun him sideways, falling back into the rack of cues. For several seconds, Patrick fired at the thugs as fast as he could snatch up the pool balls, yellow, red, and blue missiles streaking across the room. Then he made a dive for the door and escaped. At eight o'clock that evening, he collected Lucia, and as they drove across the river into South London, he gave her a brief outline of his adventures at the pool hall. He felt he should warn her about the kind of people they were up against. Oh, Patrick, suppose they come after you. Next time you could be badly hurt. Don't worry. I rang Hadley with a description of both men. He'll have them in for questioning by now, and he'll beaver away until he finds out who's running this murder club. Do you think those thugs know who's running it? Do we even know if it really exists? Thanks to a rat-faced man called Luke Parsons, I believe they were expecting me at the pool hall. <laughs> but why would he let two criminals know he's just betrayed them? He'd never do that. No, but he might have warned the head of the murder club, whoever he is, and he might have warned the thugs. Oh, I wish you'd never got involved in this. If anything happened to you... Nothing's going to happen to me. <sighs> Let's change the subject. Where's this special place we're going to? What's so special about it? It's called the chapel. Not far from the Priory, where Mrs. Taylor lived. Ah, yes, the third house. Who lives there? Nobody. And it isn't a house. You'll see. Oh, I, I, I recognise this. Isn't this the road? Yes, what? that's the Priory, on the right. Oh, what's the matter? Why are we stopping? Well, there's no one living in the house now, is there? No, of course not. I saw a light in the first floor window. There, there it is again. But who on earth... Oh, Patrick, I'm frightened. I'm going to find out what's going on. Stay here. No, while... I'm not staying in the car by myself. I'm coming with you. This is the drawing room. There's no sign of anyone. Perhaps it was a trick of the light. The headlamps reflected on the window. Something like that. Oh, no, I saw a light moving around. Probably a torch. 
Please, Lucia, I, I wish you'd go back to the car. I wish you'd stop all this detective nonsense. And I wish you'd both clear out and leave me in peace. Doctor, what the devil are you doing here? An apt choice of words. I came here to investigate, and my investigation has already uncovered some devilish secrets. If I may say so, your cryptic remarks sometimes sound very much like sheer hocus-pocus. I don't suppose you're going to tell us what you've found. Well, certainly I am. I searched Mrs. Taylor's dressing table and found two very interesting items. A silver cross on a chain and a pair of garters. Now I know you're teasing us. Women don't wear garters nowadays, or so I'm told, do they, Lucia? Oh, I know Aunt Mildred was a little old-fashioned, but no, I don't think uh, so. Perhaps I should add that there was something strange about both these items. The cross was hanging upside down on his chain, and the garters were bright scarlet. And does that bring us any closer to the murder club and the person who runs it? <laughs> oh, yes. Can you, will you tell us how? I can and will. You deserve to know the deadliness of the enemy you're fighting. Oh, by the way, Hadley told me about your escapade this afternoon. But I'm afraid the police raid on the pool hall was a fiasco. What do you mean? One of your adversaries, Henry Lord, is now in hospital with a fractured shoulder. But the other, George Grice, known as Goldie because of his gold teeth, got away before the squad car arrived and is still at large. Do you have a firearms license? No. Ah, this is where you should. Hadley can arrange that for you. Do you really think I'd waste a bullet on a thug like that? Oh, for pity's sake, be sensible. This afternoon, Goldie thought you were a fool. But he doesn't think so now. He won't give you a chance. He'll sneak up on you when you least expect it. He might be looking for you now, at this very moment. What if he is? Doctor, are you or are you not going to tell us what you know about the murder club? I take it this gang have developed some new kind of racket. Well, it isn't new. This cloak for devilry, which you call a racket, is as old as sin. Ever since the Middle Ages, the Red Garter has been the badge of the witch, the worshipper of Satan. Well, you're not suggesting Mrs. Taylor was the leader of some kind she of... She also wore an inverted cross, another mark of Satanism. No, she was not the leader, but she was very close to him. Tell me, Mrs. Renshaw, did you never suspect that your husband was the head of a witch cult? Not until lunchtime today, when Mr. Butler started to explain. I knew he had some strange secret, but I never dreamed... I mean, witchcraft and Satan, nowadays. Nowadays, more than ever. Because the world is in chaos, this evil flourishes. Doubly dangerous, since it attracts not only morbid sensation seekers, but also potential murderers. Murderers? Of course. The witch cult has always been the cloak for the wholesale poisoner. Last night at your house, I talked about an organization which distributed poison. But I couldn't think how it worked so successfully undercover. And there and then, in your drawing room, I saw a large silver candelabra. And I understood. You pointed out that it needed dusting. The candle holders were black. Yes, black. With wax, my friend. Not with dust. Wax from black candles to celebrate a black mass. Not at this house, but in a building not far from here. A building that now belongs to you, Mrs. Renshaw. The chapel. I knew Richard visited it sometimes. That's why I wanted to take you there, Pat. I was too scared to go on my own. We were on our way there when we saw your light in the window. Splendid. I've already arranged to meet Hadley at the chapel. You can give me a lift. Ah, he must be here already. Unless someone else has a key. Yes, when well, I have a torch, I'll lead the way. Oh, it's quite an ordinary chapel. Some of the pews are broken and it needs cleaning, but otherwise it's just ordinary. It may appear to be ordinary, but we are looking for extraordinary evidence. You see, now imagine you're a member of the cult, a hen-picked husband who wishes his wife dead, and you come here to achieve your heart's desire. Now, you go to a city where you're unknown, let's say Bristol. You're given the address of a certain chemist who sells you a poison called aconitine. You return home, and after a suitable interval, your wife is poisoned. With aconitine? No, 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 no. She's poisoned with arsenic. Previously, a desperate woman from Birmingham bought arsenic in Leeds. And at the next meeting, these purchases were exchanged. So when your wife dies of arsenic in London, how could anyone trace it to you? Buying aconitine in Bristol. So that's the ingenious new device. New? 
My dear sir, it was used by a Satanist cult in 1746. But what are you looking for here? Records, dates, names, addresses. You think those records exist? Richard Renshaw was running a very complex organization. He must have had enough records to fill a fighting cabinet. Had those men searched your house, Mrs. Renshaw, and your husband's office in the city without success. So we reached the conclusion that the paperwork must be here. In this chapel? But there's nowhere to... Oh! I've overheard voices. Come down here and see for yourselves. Just ahead of us, a section of the floor had opened up and Hadley's head and shoulders emerged through a large trap door. We followed him down some wooden steps with some difficulty on my part and found ourselves in the crypt, a very different place of worship. There's a strange smell. Incense. Something else I can't quite... Marijuana. A drug used to remove inhibitions. No, it's something more mundane than that. I know what it is. It's paraffin oil, isn't it? There's probably a stove somewhere to keep the place warm. What are those two boxes side by side? Almost like telephone kiosks. Looks very much like a confessional. Yes. Except the worshippers don't come here to confess their sins. They come to confess their desires and have them granted. At a price. Oh, we can't waste time talking. We've got to examine every inch of this place to find those confounded records. The low roof, held up by a dozen pillars, was dimly lit by a single electric globe, which gave just enough light to reveal the heavy curtains that covered the walls. And at the far end, a statue of Satan on the altar, and a silver candelabra holding seven black candles. Look! It's exactly like mine. We're going to need all the light we can get. Has anyone got a match? Ah, here you are. Thanks. Where do we start our search? How about behind those curtains? There could be a cupboard hidden away. No, nothing but the walls. Solid concrete. But the papers have got to be here somewhere. For my money, I'd say they're probably inside the confessional box. Well, any luck? No. Nothing here but a hassock to kneel on and the grill you whisper through to whoever's on the other side. There are all these cushions on the floor. The papers could be hidden in there. Inside the cushion covers, perhaps. Good idea. Lucky I've got a pen knife. <laughs> we worked hard, but as midnight approached, our task seemed to be hopeless. We were tired and dusty, and we had found nothing at all. It's no good. The records aren't here. They ought to be, but they aren't. What was that? What was what? A shadow. I saw it in the corner of my eye. It seemed to vanish behind one of those pillars. It's gone now. Look, there's no one else here. The candles are throwing our own shadows onto the curtains. No, I'm afraid we must admit defeat. And get some fresh air. Oh, please. I hate all this black magic. Let's go. Did you say magic? Yes. Why? Ah, uh, Listen. You three go on up. Wait for me in the car. I'll join you in exactly three minutes. What's wrong? Why do you want to stay down here? Because I know where the papers are hidden. Now, it's my turn for a little hocus-pocus. I promise to put those papers in your hands in three minutes, all right? Patrick told me later that it was the word magic that sparked him off. It suddenly struck him that the confessional box looked rather like the magic cabinets used by conjurers. Inside the box, he discovered the ceiling was made of plywood, and as he ran his fingers round the edge, it dropped down. But there was nothing inside. And at that moment, through the mesh of the griddle, he saw the gleam of gold teeth. <gasps> You're too late, mister. I've been there already. Is this what you were looking for? Hand them over. Come and get them. Right! Patrick burst out of the confessional like a jack-in-the-box, but Goldie was equally quick on his feet. And as they stood face to face, his teeth gleamed in a reminiscent smile. You knocked me down. I did, and I'm ready to do it again. But you done it like an amateur. You never done much fighting, did you, mister? No, I never bothered to learn. Never bothered. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll learn you all right. Fine. What are you waiting for? <laughs> and with that, Patrick launched himself at Goldie, leading with a right hook that would have been murderous if it had landed. For the next few minutes, he seemed to become a punch bag. As he fell, he was vaguely aware that he had knocked over the candelabra. Coloured lights exploded around him. Or were those 
tongues of flame licking along the edge of the curtains. Blimey, look out! Put your hands up, you! Come off it, we can't stay here! Why not? Because we'll be burned alive, that's why! We've got to get out! You're not leaving here till you give me those papers! And that was when the paraffin vapour went up in a sheet of flame. Goldie tried to make a dash for the stairs, but Patrick was too quick for him. Are you farming? Get your hands off me! Give me those papers and I'll let you go! Here, take your bleeding papers! All right. <coughs> you fall fair. Withdraw all charges. Go! Goldie stumbled up the stairs, and Patrick grabbed the scattered papers from the carpet as the flames crept closer. Then, choking in the thick smoke, he too made his escape. Next day, Patrick cancelled all his appointments, and when I called on him that evening, he was still bearing some signs of the punishment he'd taken. Please, sit down, make yourself comfortable. Uh, thank you. And are you fairly comfortable? Uh, frankly, no. Uh, it even hurts me to talk. Oh, cheer up. I'm sure nothing will ever stop you talking. <laughs> <laughs> Have you spoken to Mrs. Renshaw today? No, not yet. Yeah, but my dear chap, she'll be so worried. You were in a terrible state when she last saw you. What do you mean by that? Well, we've been sitting in the car waiting for you. We didn't know what was going on in the crypt. Suddenly, a smoky-faced man staggered out of the chapel and ran off down the road. A few minutes later, you appeared, handed me a bundle of papers, made an elaborate apology for keeping us waiting more than three minutes, then collapsed in a dead faint. I have never fainted in my life. Well, let's say that you were momentarily indisposed. Mrs. Renshaw took one look at you and the papers, then got out of the car and walked off into the night. I haven't seen her since. Finally, I understand from Hadley that you do not wish to prefer charges against your assailant, uh, Mrs. Uh, Goldie, uh, George uh, Grice. Yes, yes. Uh, I just found this piece of paper stuck to the windscreen of your car. I don't know how long it had been there. All day, I imagine. You and me haven't finished yet, G.G. Ah. Incidentally, have you seen the evening paper? No, why? A uh, private inquiry agent found strangled. Shortly after six o'clock last night, the body of Mr. Luke Parsons was found by a charwoman cleaning the detective agency offices. The victim, who had been first stunned by a blow to the head, was found seated at his desk, strangled with a scarlet cord looped round his neck and slowly tightened. I see. So this is the showdown, the third and final round. Uh, did you do as I suggested? Get yourself a gun? No, and I shan't. But don't you understand you now have two sets of enemies? Goldie and his cronies, Babs, and the new leader of the witch cult. Don't you see that? I see we now have three murders and one murderer. There are also three servants. One is Alice Griffin, Mrs. Taylor's housekeeper. The second is Joyce Wallace, Mrs. Taylor's companion nurse secretary. Now, I know Alice Griffin was telling the truth, and I know Joyce Wallace did not kill Mrs. Taylor. But... We all overlooked Mrs. Renshaw's servant, a girl called Kitty Owen, who was responsible for cleaning the candelabra, a conventional domestic. And as such, she was below suspicion. Below suspicion? What do you mean by that? In a detective story, no one is above suspicion, but certain people are assumed to be below it. Any minor role, like a servant, is merely a cardboard character, which is what misled us all. Uh, may I try to explain? I should be extremely grateful. The explanation took quite a while. By the time I'd finished, it was dark outside, and I suggested we should close the curtains in case of any passers-by. This is a cul-de-sac. We don't have any passers-by. Or were you thinking of an uninvited guest? The documents you found last night proved without any question that Renshaw was the former head of the cult and Mrs. Taylor the second in command, with a third person to assist both of them. Therefore, I... Th Forgive me, but uh, it's getting late. If you'll excuse me. Very well, and I, I shall take my leave of you. And I shall see you out. When he opened the front door, the little cul-de-sac seemed very dark. It was impossible to tell who might be lurking in the shadows. I'll walk to the end with you. You'll be able to pick up a cab pretty easily. Oh, I, I'm sure I shall. Oh, I found this book at Mrs. Taylor's on the history of witchcraft. It might interest you. Thank you. I wonder if her spirit is hovering tonight. I don't know. But I think someone else may be. Then you'd better not hang about. Get home safely. I shall say good night to you, sir. To a man whom, despite certain eccentricities, 
I admire very much. Good night, Doctor. If you're there, if you can hear me, why don't you come out of the shadows and face me? But no one answered him. Taking a last look round, Patrick returned to his flat. As he entered his study, he realized he had been foolish to leave the front door open. When he caught the whiff of perfume, he knew he was not alone. Good evening. Good evening, Miss Wallace. The last time we met, you called me Joyce. Last time we met, you said I wouldn't see you again until you could prove the identity of the murderer. And now I brought you my proof. I didn't poison Mrs. Taylor. I can prove that now. Oh, I know that, my dear. It was an accident, wasn't it? But what else have you got to tell me? I killed Dick Renshaw. I am the head of the witch cult. Yes, I knew that too. Oh, oh yes, I'm sure you did. May I sit down? Why don't we both sit down? That's better. Shall I tell you what happened on the night Mrs. Taylor died? You went to Hampstead to poison your lover, Dick Renshaw. Oh? And why would I do a dreadful thing like that? Because he'd thrown you over, as he'd thrown over so many women. And once he was dead, you would take control of the witch cult. It was highly profitable. You already had an informer in the Renshaw household, the maid, Kitty Owen, who tipped you off about everything that went on there. You knew Dick was away on business, and Lucia was out to dinner with friends. So Kitty let you in, and you poisoned his water carafe. That was your little secret, and it nearly hanged you for the wrong death. Go on. When you left Mrs. Taylor's house, you dared not use the back door. The Griffins lived at the back, and they might have seen you, so you went out by the front door. And when you returned, you carelessly let it slam. It was the front door the Griffins heard. You also forgot to replace the key in the back door. Am I right so far? Oh, please don't stop. This is fascinating. But while you were out, Mrs. Taylor had been fretting and fuming about her Epsom salts. She couldn't sleep, so she got up and went to your room, where she found the Epsom salts tin, which contained antimony. It must have been quite a shock when you returned and found her dead. Yes, a horrible shock. And you realised, with Mrs. Taylor out of the way and Renshaw due to die when he returned from his travels, you'd achieved your heart's desire. And then you were arrested for a murder you hadn't committed. I imagine that before they took you away, you must have telephoned your helpful friend, Kitty. Of course. At first, she absolutely adored Dick Renshaw. But when he chucked her as well, she soon changed her mind. I told her... Whatever happened, she mustn't touch the water carafe. So she was, in effect, your accomplice. As for you, I was right when I said you were as guilty as hell. <laughs> yes, and you attracted me like hell. I hope you knew that. You were cleared in court for murdering Mrs. Taylor, and it seemed you couldn't possibly be responsible for Renshaw's death, since you were still in custody when it happened. But when you left the courtroom... Free at last, I suppose you got in touch with Luke Parsons and Goldie. Oh, you mean George? I found them both, of course. And after I called on Parsons and he told me where to find Goldie, no doubt he rang you and you killed him. A man who betrays you in the smallest thing will betray you in everything. It had to be done, just like Goldie. What do you mean? <laughs> I was very angry when he let you have those papers. I gave him this address. I made him stick that note on your car. Then I gave him a revolver and told him to finish you off properly this time. But he wouldn't do it. What? That made me furious. He kept saying things like, he said I fought fair. He said he wouldn't make no charges against me. And he kept his word. I won't do it. <laughs> so naturally, he had to die. <gasps> Darling... What's wrong? You are what is wrong. Through and through. If he were alive, I'd be proud to shake his hand. And you had him killed? Oh, no. I shot him myself. He wouldn't use the gun, so it seemed like poetic justice. You'll soon find out what justice is. Do you suppose I'm the only one who knows the evidence against you? Dr. Fell knows. Superintendent Hadley knows. 
I don't have your precious papers. Scotland Yard has those. Kitty Owen will be taken in for questioning and you will be taken back to Holloway. And there, you will hang. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> don't move. You see? I still have the gun. <laughs> <laughs> you knew I was a murderer. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> As I believe I mentioned, I am never wrong. My dear Patrick, now that the trial of Joyce Wallace is over, I venture to answer your letter. The girl is a fanatic, and I think the jury realised that. I believe the verdict of guilty but insane was both merciful and sensible. I do wish to congratulate you on your engagement to Lucia Renshaw. She is as charming as you are gallant, and I am sure that you will both be very happy. You should be grateful to gallantry, my dear fellow. <laughs> After all, if you had not bowed gracefully to Joyce Wallace when she fired at you, that bullet would have entered your heart instead of striking your collarbone. That you would live a long while to enliven this dull world is the hope of, your sincerely, Gideon Fell. In Below Suspicion by John Dixon Carr, Dr. Gideon Fell was played by Donald Sindon. Chief Superintendent Hadley, John Hartley. Patrick Butler, James Fleet. Joyce Wallace, Connie Walker. Lucia Renshaw, Becky Hindley. Alice Griffin, Richenda Carey. Luke Parsons, Terence Edmund. Henry Lord, Mark Holloway. George Goldie Grice, Christopher Brennan. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Below Suspicion was dramatised for radio by Peter Ling and directed by Enid Williams. <laughs>